Among the easiest and most effective computer upgrades are adding a math coprocessor, replacing ROMs with new ones, and increasing RAM. All these upgrades can be completed in under an hour. The first step is to purchase the right chips. The study unit about the motherboard will give you the guidelines you need to do this. It's extremely important to install the right chips in a system. Installing the wrong chips will be at best a waste of money, at worst it will damage the computer. So be sure you carefully read any documentation that came with the chips you're installing. When you receive chips, the legs may be bent outward slightly. You should place the chip on its side on a flat surface and press gently. This will straighten the legs so they'll fit into the sockets correctly. We discussed this procedure in more detail in the study unit about the motherboard. Begin by removing the system unit case. This procedure is covered in section 3 of this video, so we won't repeat it here. If you feel it's necessary, review section 3 now. Be sure the computer is turned off and unplugged. It's also a good idea to wear the anti-static wrist strap or work on an anti-static mat. Static electricity can damage the chips you're installing or other chips on the motherboard. Let's begin by installing a math coprocessor. First, find the socket for the math coprocessor. Now, look at the math coprocessor chip. If you are installing an 8087 or 8287, the indentation on the chip should be aligned in the same way as the indentation on the socket. The 8387 will have a clipped corner that matches a similar shape on the socket. You should pay careful attention that you align the chip correctly. Place the coprocessor on the socket, but don't push it into place yet. Check to see that it's aligned correctly and that the pins match the holes in the socket. Once you're sure the pins are aligned correctly and are positioned over each socket hole, press the coprocessor into place. You may find it necessary to rock the coprocessor back and forth slightly as you are pressing it into place. Replacing ROMs is somewhat more complicated because you must first remove the old ROMs. Section 4 of this video explains how to remove and handle chips. If you feel it's necessary, review Section 4 now. The ROMs are relatively easy to identify because of their size and labeling. Draw a diagram of where the ROMs are located on the motherboard. Include identifying information so you'll know which chip goes where. This will help you install the new chips and give you a fallback position if you must reinstall the old ones. Use a chip puller to loosen the existing ROMs from their sockets. Be sure you insert the chip puller under the chip and not under the socket. Once you've loosened it, remove the chip the rest of the way, being careful not to crack the chip's case or bend the pins. If you must set the old ROM down, place it carefully on a clean surface. Most technicians usually put the old ROM chip back into the packaging in which the new ROMs were shipped. This will protect the old ROMs just in case you have to reuse them later. Insert the first new ROM in the socket. The documentation that came with the chips and their labeling will help you decide which ROM should go in first. Align the pins correctly over each socket hole and press the ROM into place. You may find it necessary to rock the ROM back and forth as you're pressing it into place. Repeat the process for the remaining ROMs. Replacing or increasing RAM is actually quite simple to do, but difficult to explain because there are so many ways to accomplish it. If you're working with an older PC, XT, or AT, the motherboard probably contains all the RAM it can hold. Additional memory will have to be installed by adding an expansion card. If you must replace RAM on these older systems, you must first match the chip type, as we explain in the study unit about the motherboard. Identify which RAMs are bad and must be replaced, and then follow the general procedures we describe in the study units. The chip handling procedures we describe for installing a math coprocessor or replacing ROMs will guide you in replacing RAM chips on the motherboard. Many newer computers use one megabyte SIMs. 
These are single inline memory modules that contain several RAM chips that equal one megabyte of memory. Although installing additional SIMs is one of the easiest upgrades you can undertake, you should carefully read the documentation that came with the SIMs in addition to viewing this section and reading the appropriate study units. Begin the procedure by matching the specification of existing SIMs. If you wanted to add one megabyte, you would install a single one megabyte SIM, two 512 kilobyte SIMs, and so on. The SIMs are easy to find because of their distinctive shape. You'll see several empty sockets near the existing SIMs. The new SIMs will go in these sockets. Remove the new SIM from its package and grasp it by the top. Never touch the edge connectors. Slip the SIM into the socket beside the existing SIM. You may have to rock it slightly. When it is seated correctly, the clips at the sides of the socket will hold the SIMs in place. When you increase the memory of a computer, add a coprocessor, or change ROMs, you might have to tell the computer what you've done. There are several ways of accomplishing this, and they're covered in various study units. Remember, if you replace or add chips and don't tell the system what you've done, it won't run correctly. An overlooked aspect of working with computers is installing the system correctly. We're not talking about connecting the cables, installing expansion cards, and so on. Rather, we're referring to the actual physical setup of the system. If you set the system up properly, the people who use it will be more productive, and the computing environment will be safe and comfortable. The surface on which the computer is located should be flat, sturdy, and the right height. Most office desktops are at the right height, but an adjustable chair will allow the user to choose the height that's most comfortable. The work surface should be large enough for the computer, the keyboard, a mouse or trackball, and for work materials. There should be enough clearance around the computer to allow the cooling fan to work correctly. Ideally, the space behind the computer should be large enough to allow the power and connector cables to be well organized. This will make it easier to undertake maintenance and upgrading activities. The video monitor should be set up so the person using it won't suffer from excessive glare. Sunlight and fluorescent lighting are the major sources of glare. If the monitor can't be positioned so glare is minimized, you might want to consider the use of an anti-glare shield. These are available from computer stores and mail order houses. Another factor to consider when positioning the monitor and system unit is the presence of a nearby heating unit or direct sunlight. If a computer is placed too close to a heat source or in a place where direct sunlight strikes it for a long period of time, heat is likely to build up. And heat is the enemy of a computer system because it can damage components. So be sure to keep the system far enough from a heater or sunlight so the outside of the case is no warmer than the temperature of the room. Another important rule to remember is that the electrical outlet to which the computer and peripherals are connected should be clean. That is, the circuit on which the computer is located should not support other devices, such as large electrical motors, air conditioners, or a refrigerator. These devices draw large amounts of power, operate periodically and unpredictably, and create interference in the circuit. If the computer is operating when one or more of these devices comes on, it may malfunction as it would in a brownout. What's worse, the variations in the electrical current may affect the disk drives so much that files are corrupted or the disk becomes unreadable. That's why a surge suppressor or power line conditioner is necessary for every computer system. They're relatively inexpensive and can protect a system from spikes in electrical power, especially those occurring when power is restored after a brownout. If a modem or fax modem is part of the system, a surge suppressor should also be connected to the telephone jack. It's important to note that no low-priced surge suppressor will protect against a direct or nearby lightning hit. Unplugging the system is the only way to guarantee it will be undamaged. An uninterruptible power supply will also protect against lightning damage. In the last few years, there's been some discussion of the negative health effects of the electromagnetic emissions from computer video displays. Although there's no conclusive evidence linking computer use and health problems, it makes sense to take reasonable precautions. 
The simplest precaution is to ensure that the user sits at least an arm's length from the video monitor. Because the electromagnetic emissions from a monitor may be stronger from the back or sides rather than from the front, no one should spend a great deal of time working behind a video monitor. Radiation shields are available for video monitors if desired. The final step in the installation of any computer system is to see that it's ergonomically correct. Ergonomics is the study of the factors that affect worker health and productivity. When the height of the work surface is correct, when glare is minimized, and when the chair on which the user is sitting is appropriate, productivity will be enhanced. Since computers are intended to enhance productivity, it's critical that the ergonomics of the system, as well as the hardware and software, are given careful consideration.